This podcast is dedicated to those who have found their way from fear to freedom and for those who are considering undertaking this amazing journey. This is the Courage to Be podcast, and I'm your host, Tanya Vasallo. Before we get into this episode, I want to share an amazing opportunity, my signature event, Increase Your Income and Impact, which is happening this November 7th through the 9th in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You will walk away from this three-day in-person event, shifting your mindset from not enough money to manifesting on the spot. You'll also learn how to get over your fears, own your worth, so that you can have a greater impact in the world. This event is life transforming and already filling up. And don't take my word for it. Just go to our site and listen to what participants are saying. I'm gifting you an 80% discounted ticket. All you have to do is leave me a rating and review on iTunes take a screenshot and email us at help.thecouragetobe at gmail.com and type event discount to claim your discounted ticket. You can also find that email in our show notes. I look forward to being your mentor and guide and transforming your life. See you in Santa Fe. Welcome back to The Courage To Be, where we have powerful conversations to transform your life and your business. And today we have Jasmine Jonti. I did not ask you how do you pronounce it. That's it. Jasmine Jonte. You got it. Ah, oh, I did good. I'm not even going to edit it then. <laughs> Thank you for that. And welcome, Jasmine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for our conversation. And I want to start out a little bit. You specialize in teaching people how to build courses and revenue generating programs. How do you arrive here? You know, because... There's a lot of us that have knowledge, that have expertise, that are teachers by nature, and some of us by profession. How did you get to create this? Tell us a little bit about your story. It's a bit of a winding road. Yeah, I started in education. So I taught in the lowest performing school in the country in Detroit, Michigan, and I taught kindergarten and first grade. And so I very quickly in my professional career learned how to make learning simple and fun. When I pivoted to the online space, largely because I burnt out as a teacher, I realized that there's a lot of experts out there who know what they know, but don't know how to teach what they know. So they're in these one-on-one -on -one conversations and they're helping people and they have this brain that's like a filing cabinet. And they might have a hundred different files of different experiences and things that they've learned. And they talk to someone and they can pull out the one file that that person needs. But when you transition to teaching online, to teaching groups, you have to know of those hundred files, which are the 10 you need to teach and what's the order and syntax to teach those 10 files and how to make those 10 files actionable. And so what I did was I said, okay, like this is an opportunity where I have a skill set to help these other really amazing visionaries bring their message out to the world in a way that really connects and drives results for their students. And so that's what I did. And, you know, it comes from just a place of taking enough programs that you pay, I don't know, 7,500 bucks for, 10 grand for, and you get into the product and it's just like really not good. Like I only did that a couple of times and I was like, okay, I got to solve this problem now. <laughs> ah, so former teacher, realized there was a hole, there was a problem, there was a gap I could fill and just started doing it. That is awesome. And so as you were teaching people this, you know, like, I love how you said that people know what they know, but they don't know how to teach it. What would be the first step for someone that wants to pull out one of those files from that filing cabinet in our brain and want to teach something, you know, like what would work? you know, as we're wanting to pass on our knowledge, whether it's as parents, as teachers, or whatever it is, you know, in our world. Yeah, I think the easiest way to discern if something should go in your program is to imagine 10 of your ideal clients in front of you. Like imagine 10 unique individuals that you've taught before and think, would what I'm about to teach, would this topic I'm about to teach serve at least eight of them? Would at least eight of them need to know this in order to get the ultimate transformation of what you teach. And that to me, that 80%, eight out of 10 is a good indicator that something should go in the program versus not. And it's really hard to tell as an expert because you have all of these 
experiences of that one thing you told that one person that one time completely changed their life. But that one thing you told that person that one time may not be relevant or necessary to the majority of the people you teach. So it's just this question that allows you to sift and sort as to what of your content needs to go in a program versus what you should save for, you know, group coaching or one-on-one conversations or, you know, just somewhere else in your offer suite. That's interesting. So would you separate things into teaching and then coaching separately, you know, like having two different segments, like, okay, we're teaching now and we're teaching this because I plucked it out of the, you know, the 10 people, eight of you need this and then just separate both of the things. Is that the better way to do it, Jasmine? I think so. I think, you know, the key to understanding, well, a question you can ask yourself to see if your training content is good is, are you repeating yourself? Because if you're repeating yourself multiple times to multiple different people, you're not actually using your time well. If you can just put that into a training that you can give to someone so that they can understand the concept of what you're trying to get across, that's a better use of your time and that's a better use of their time. Because you can really spend your energy, intention, and effort making this one video really, really good. And then in your time with them, you can dig deeper into things that are specific to them rather than these hierarchical concepts that apply to more than one person. So, you know, that's why I like every group program, any mastermind, anytime where there's like a group setting, especially online, like in-person events are a little different, but if you're talking about like online programs, you want to have really good training content that they watch. So when they come to the group coaching sessions or the one-on-one consultations, They can ask you questions that are really informed and educated because they already understand the main principles of what you teach. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I was going to ask you with that though, what I found, and I'm curious to hear your perspective because you do specialize in this and you've observed it too, and you've been part of, you know, these higher paying, you know, masterminds classes. And when I say higher paying, it's 5k, 10k, you know, like these are 25k. Yeah. 30k. Yeah. It's so it's like, (laughs) we're looking at numbers that it's not like, oh yeah, I took a $300 course, you know? So what do you feel? Cause I feel like in that world, cause I've been part of it for many years now, there's certain formats that just don't retain people. Like, I don't feel like the success is there, you know, like maybe only 10 or 15% of the people that take the course or whatever are having the success. Whereas like a big number, you'd say like 80% aren't. So how do you retain people and create the content, like get them to go listen to the content, you know, like what's working or what's not working for anyone of us that's wanting to teach online, you know, like what's your findings in that Jasmine? Yeah, there's so much you can do. I think it all comes down to understanding who your ideal client is and then what's the offer that's going to keep them engaged. If that's for, you know, if you're thinking about moms, for instance, let's say you have a group of moms that you're teaching parenting to, the community is going to be really, really important for them. If you think about just that audience, what are they known for? They're known for connection and community, and they might not even take any of the training videos, but they'll stay because their friends are in it and they don't want to lose connection to their friends. So you're driving toward the need that these women have, which is connection and group So I think it's all about understanding your ideal client and then aligning the offer with your ideal client, you know, and if you think about any kind of offer that really hinges on the group element. So I'm thinking specifically about communities, memberships, and masterminds where they're coming for a transformation, but they're coming for more than a transformation. You really want to make sure you're doing everything you can to get that engagement and to build the connective tissue between the people in the group. It's not about you as the leader, right? They're coming for the, you know, hit the buy button because they're coming for the content, but they stay for the community. And if I think about, you know, the super high level $25,000, $30,000 masterminds that we're in, the content is like, yeah, it's great, but we're in it because we get to see our friends three times a year. <laughs> like, that's why we keep coming back. It's not just, we have these really solid foundational relationships in our life that we value. 
And that's what the facilitator is doing is they're facilitating the networking and connection among these like-minded people. So it's a long-winded answer, but if you think about communities, masterminds, and like those kinds of group kind of offerings, you want to do things to build that connective tissue, which is completely separate. I mean, you can connect it to the training content, but there's a lot you can do that's unrelated to the training content itself. Yeah. What would be some examples for you of that you've seen that have been successful? I think uh, a very simple one is having community language. So, you know, calling certain moments, certain things, or having an identifier of like, if you're in this group, you are an X, because now there's significance associated with being a part of the group. And there's pain because in leaving the group, because now it's like, oh, I won't be an X anymore. Right. So we're in flight club mastermind as one of ours. And they call us flight clubbies, like flight clubbies, like fly a plane, not fight club, flight, like fly a plane. And it's like, oh, I don't want to not be a flight clubby anymore. And it's to someone who's hearing this for the first time, you might be like, that's like a really stupid nickname. But when you're in the community and you're in the group and people are bought into it and you hear, oh, hey, flight clubby over and over again, it starts to attach to your identity. And then you don't want to be, you know, disconnected from that. So I think that having just common language and actually in many groups I've been a part of and facilitated, we even have like a glossary of terms, like a glossary of terms directly connected to our community and things that we say to each other. So that it's like insider language, you know, if someone else heard you talking about it, they wouldn't understand. But because you have these terms for certain things together, when you have this glossary that outlines it, really, really helpful to build that connective tissue. That is so beautifully said, because as you were explaining it, and it's such a great tip for anyone that's leading these type of communities. It's a wonderful way of engaging and creating that community. And I'm going back in my own story of like communities I've been in. I'm like, oh my God, she's so right. Yeah, we have that term and we have this. And without realizing it created that bond and that connection with everyone else. So thank you for sharing that one. That's a beautiful tip of sharing with us, with the community, with the listener So what in your thoughts, what makes a good teacher? I mean, coming from Detroit, one of the, you know, lowest ranking schools, like how do you motivate? How do you install confidence in your students? Obviously you have to have been a good teacher, but in your own eyes, what makes a good teacher? I think a lot of what we can apply from there to here when it comes to teaching is keeping things simple enough so that people can actually do what you're asking them to do. Like teaching really is the art of simplification. So simplifying things so that they're sticky and easy to remember for your students. And you can do that with frameworks really well. You can do that with catchphrases really well. Like there's lots of different ways to do that, but making things simple and sticky so they remember it and they can apply it and take action is really big. And The other thing about when you're teaching a group of kids over the course of a year is you don't just like put the, I'll call it the mindset information, you know, like how to be a good kindergartner. You don't just put that in the first week and then the rest of the year you don't talk about how to be a good kindergartner or how to be a successful kindergartner or whatever verb you or adjective you want to throw in there. And I find a lot of people make this mistake that they put their mindset training content at the very beginning of the program. And then like, it's like segmented and compartmentalized into this one area when that's not where it's the most important. It's most important to talk about those mindset paradigm shifts where they're going to get stuck, which is probably somewhere in the middle. So rather than like thinking about, you know, mindsets over here and then all the training is over here, when you first you look at the training content and the different topics and you think, what are the mindset hangups they're going to have for each of these topics? And then you infuse that mindset training into the topic rather than compartmentalized at the front end of the course. And when you're teaching a, a general ed classroom, there's you're literally in front of them all day. There's no way to compartmentalize it. So I don't know how our industry got in this thing of like mindset's really important. And so mindset support, so important. I'm going to, you know, pull it out over here and make it its own thing when it's not its own thing. 
it's completely related to everything else they need to do. So, if, you know, a couple things there, right? Make everything really actionable and then integrate mindset with actual tasks that you're asking them to do. <laughs> Those are great. That is so important because I do see, I feel like mindset does tend to be like, oh, let's tackle this first. Because once you have the mindset all set up, and like you said, the breakdowns tend to happen midway through. And that's when everyone's going to be in the middle of where they're going to need the mindset. So thanks for that clarification. We're going to take a quick pause, Jasmine, and we'll come right back. I want to share an amazing opportunity with you. My signature event increase your income and impact, which is happening this November 7th through the 9th in person in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You will walk away from these three days, shifting your mindset from not enough money to manifesting on the spot. You'll also learn how to get over your fears and unworthiness so that you can have a greater impact on the world. These in-person events are life transforming. Just listen to what one of our participants has to say. Hi, my name is Georgette Lombardo, and I have just finished attending an event hosted by Tanya Vasayo. It is called Increase Your Income and Impact. She helps women entrepreneurs be the best versions of themselves in creating amazing income and impact in their community. Kind of clever name. I have worked with Tanya on and off since 2017, and this is now my fourth event. At first I was thinking, do I have time for this? Am I going to learn anything? And the answer is yes. Yes, I have time for this. Yes, I need to make time for myself. And yes, I learned some new things. Because even though I've heard some messages before, that was when I was first starting out. And now I am much more accomplished with Tanya's help. If you need to get unstuck, Tanya is your gal. If you found this inspiring, if you'd like to join us in Santa Fe, New Mexico this November, I'm gifting you an 80% discounted ticket. All you have to do is leave me a rating and a review on iTunes, take a screenshot and email us at help.thecouragetobe at gmail.com and type in event discount to claim your discounted ticket. You can find that email in our show notes as well as the website to our event. I look forward to being your mentor and guide to transform your life. See you in Santa Fe. So we were talking about mindset, we were talking about teachings, and what are some no-nos about teaching that you would be like, oh my God, you know, like that person is just not doing it right. They're not going to retain. I love seeing it from the perspective of a teacher because I tend to go to speaking engagements because I love speaking in public and I love, even if I'm not interested in the training, I just want to go and see how the speaker does to be like, oh yeah, they did this great or move that I note to self, don't do that, you know, that bomb. So what is it for teachers? What are those no-nos as we're teaching that you've observed through experience? My mind is just spinning with so, so, so many. I'm trying to choose which one's the most egregious. Uh, I think one thing that's related to branding and business and, but especially these kinds of expert businesses is remembering that you're not the hero you're the guide so this is you know coined by story brand donald miller and story brand and they're talking about it in relationship to personal branding but i also think it's really important in relationship to your teaching there's a lot of people out there who talk about the authority frame and building your authority and that's like very important to get to someone to say yes initially but remember once they've said yes it's no longer about you it's all about them and I would even argue that in your marketing and things, maybe don't make it a little bit less about you, make it a little bit more about them. And so I have a lot of people who want to start their course with a video that's like about me, you know, and like a my story video. And it's not the place for it. Like they're already said yes to you. They already know enough about you to be bought in. So like get to the heart of it and help make this about them. And even a lot of the examples and stories that people use inside of their program, they talk about themselves and their stories. And I definitely think there's a place for that. You want to be relatable. You want people to see that, you know, you can start from anywhere. But at this point, if you're building a program, you should have client stories. Showcasing your client stories and showcasing how you might be the next client story when I, you know, revamp this program or in the next program, that's way more motivating than for you to talk about you. So I think it's kind of like 
just remembering like your students are the hero here and it's your job to be the Yoda and like help them on this path to, to their own main character energy moment. So I think that's a biggie. Another biggie that I see people just shouldn't do inside of programs is putting all of the responsibility on the student to get results. And what I mean by that is, yes, it's their responsibility to do the work, but it's your responsibility as the teacher to make the work easy to do. A lot of folks just say, well, I put all of my training in there, but it's like, but did you really look at it from an instructional design perspective? Did you provide resources? Did you provide support that allows them to ask questions? Like, are you doing everything in your power to make the work easy to do? And if not, then make some shifts because yeah, it's on them to, like I said, to do the work, but we've got to make that work easy. Like that's why they're paying us. Not just for what's in your brain, but for ease of application of the information in your brain. So those are two things, two very different things, but I see, I think that can just really, if everyone did that, it would raise the standard in the industry and we wouldn't get all the flack that we get in this whole coach consultant world, unfortunately. That's great. These are some great tips that it's leading me up to this other question that I had. What makes people stick? I mean, besides the, I mean, you gave us a couple of them, you know, like the names and creating community and having like your private dictionary, the identifiers, you know, like these are great, but are there any things, you know, like you mentioned before masterminds and memberships, what makes people stick in some of these memberships and masterminds and not stick in other ones? You know, is it the content? Is it the way people are teaching? And maybe you can even give an example with yourself. You might not want to name the course or the people that you learn with, but just of like what you could have, you know, like, oh, well, if they would have done this differently, maybe they, I would have stayed there another year or I would have renewed or something. Like, what have you noticed in the industry? I think it's a little bit of everything, which is why it's hard. I mean, like, I wish I could say it's these three things, but I really don't think it is. I'll talk about my mastermind that I facilitated and ran before I even started doing my agency work. Like, this is what I, after I left teaching, like many people do when they leave a career, I was trying to find my place and like where my skill set really would shine. And this is where it does in course creation. But between leaving and where I am now, there was, I don't know, a year and a half where I led a mastermind. And my retention was like 88%. It was in the high, it was 87 or 88%, meaning people would buy with me, 87 to 88% of them would buy the next mastermind. And then still in that next tier, it was somewhere around 60% would buy the next, like, and then they would come back. Like they would take a break, but they would come back. And I think about, I didn't know that that was not normal. I just thought this is how it should be, right? Is if you have clients and you over deliver for them, they will stay with you. And looking back, that was definitely a part of it is I had this skill set of teaching to make things clear and simple and actionable so people actually saw results because I helped them track their results. I helped them get results. Another element of it was the community is they were staying for each other. They weren't just staying for me. They were staying for the friends that they met in this group. But I think a third element is just offer. It's just it was an enticing offer for them. They couldn't find this offer anywhere else, which at the time I was supporting people who were, I would consider them like personal development junkies. Like they're going to, this was pre-pandemic. They're going to a lot of events. They're meeting a lot of people, but they go home and they don't make any changes. So they're just kind of junky. They're on this like wheel of consuming, consuming, going to events, meeting people, but nothing actually makes a difference in their day-to-day life. And it's because they needed a container to help them integrate those changes into their day-to-day life. And to have community, even if they were surrounded by a toxic work environment, they had, you know, their social mastermind group that would support them in making those changes. So long story short, I think that that offer at that time, no one was doing that. And so it was the element of the offer of like, I can't get this anywhere else with, I love these people and I don't want to lose them with Jasmine makes it really easy for me to get results. So you put those few things together and it was like slam dunk, no brainer. Let's do it. That being said, I can also think of clients who have training programs that in the past who haven't had great retention. And sometimes one of those three things are missing. And I would say usually it's in the offer space of they just 
get the result and there's no continued support needed. It's like if you're in a niche where once someone gets your transformation, like I'm thinking about divorce and custody case mastery, which is a program that we've built. Once your divorce is over, like you don't need to be a part of the course anymore. You don't need to have any more law support because like the transformation is done. It is complete. So sometimes depending on your niche, it's just harder to create, you know, retention and continuity programs as well. But yeah, I always come back to those three things, like really juicy offer, really get community and connection and actionable, easy to implement, get results teaching. That's great. And because I have so many questions with the, you know, how you set it up and all that, but I'm going to pivot a little bit. Do you feel that adults and kids, like what is the difference between teaching <laughs> adults and kids? Because I feel like adults, sometimes we have to unlearn a lot and kids are faster at learning, but and your journey with all of this, like what has been the difference between the two? Like the biggest difference is the fact that kids do not opt in to go to school and they do not have high expectations of school because they don't know any better. They're just like, I'm a kid. I go to school. I've got to go to school. Doesn't matter if I have the awesome teacher or the shitty teacher. Like I got to go to school and, you know, learn from my teacher and they don't really know what to expect. They don't really know what good teaching looks like and what bad teaching looks like. It's just like, this is what it is. When you're an adult and you buy an experience, there's an inherent expectation that comes with that. And also, you know, you're more, sometimes it's, they're easier to engage because if they're spending their hard-earned money on a learning experience, they really do want the results. They really do want to get the outcome. So it's a, sometimes kids are easier to engage because they have lower expectations but sometimes adults are easier to engage because they chose to be here. So it's a little bit too different. You know, I say it kind of levels out. Kids are fun. I mean, I taught littles, right? I taught K-1 kids. And they're funny and generally easy to please. And, you know, they're excited about life. And adults come with more baggage and more mindset stuff that you've got to work through. But adults, like, to have a kid, I mean, as the creator as the teacher to have a kid say to me like oh my gosh miss jante that math lesson was so awesome like i am so excited about learning to add ones to any number but when an adult says it it almost has more weight because they have more of an experience and similarly it's the same thing if it goes negative when a kid says like miss jante i hate math it's like okay whatever but when an adult says like your course is shit it has a lot more weight to it so from the receiving perspective of being a support person for both ages, I'd say it's probably easier to support kids, but from a, a giving perspective, I mean, I think business is way easier than teaching. Everybody's always like, oh my gosh, business is so hard. And I'm like, no, it's not. Like, it's really not compared to everything that a teacher has to do every day. Tell me more about that. Like, where do you see the bigger difficulties for a teacher versus a business person, an entrepreneur? I mean, as a teacher, it's a lot of the things that a typical nine to fiver would deal with. You are just, you have very little control over your days. You know, in my teaching experience, which I'll admit is a little out of the norm, I would be there for 12 hours a day. I didn't get a lunch break. I didn't get a recess break. Two, three days a week, I would get a specials break, you know, for 45 minutes. I mean, it, the kids would come in at like, I don't remember exactly, but like 7.30 to 3.30. And in that entire time, I had no prep. So I had to prep outside of those windows. And the administration is just telling you more and more things you, to do. You have to conform to what their idea of good teaching is. You don't get any resources. I mean, I was making $38,000 a year and I got $500 from the state to do up my classroom, like, and buy books and like all of the things. And so I think it's just, it's hard to explain to someone who's never been a teacher, but there it is more time consuming, much more of an energy drain. You have so much less control. And meanwhile, the stakes are so high. I mean, like if these kids in the experience, the goal was to help them grow a year and a half of learning within the one year that we had them because they were usually, they were coming into kindergarten, they were coming into first grade and they were already behind. 
And so if you consider year over year, if I can grow them a year and a half, and if the second grade teacher can grow them a year and a half, and if the third grade teacher can grow them a year and a half, maybe they will have the opportunity to go to college, right? If that's what they want to do, to start a business, to do what they want to do with their life, because they have the basic skill set in order to do that, to get a, a job that supports them and their family. And, you know, so my kids did, like I grew a year and a half to two years. I was a little better at teaching math. My kids generally grew more in math than reading, though they did grow a year and a half in reading in the one year that they had me. But like the stakes are so high. And especially with entrepreneurship as a solopreneur, like you just got to worry about yourself and your own clients. And yeah, the responsibility gets more like now I have a team of nine. I've got salaries. I've got payroll. Like Yes, the responsibility is more now that I have that, but it still doesn't feel nearly as weighty as it did when you're like, you feel responsible for these kids' futures. So energetically, it's more challenging from a literal time standpoint of like how much time you have to put into it. It's more like the less control, it's more challenging. So yeah, it's always funny when people are like, oh my gosh, entrepreneurship is so hard. And I'm just like, from this perspective of this is such a blessing and this is cake. That is awesome. Yeah, Yeah. you're so right. And it's just, it's so bad that the teachers are so underpaid. So, you know, like run to the bone, you know, not enough time. And they want to help because they have it in their heart, you know, of just like you said, this responsibility of educating our future kids that will become future adults, you know, like our mm-hmm. present kids that will become future adults. So if you could wave a magic wand and restructure part of the educational system, like what would you do for our kids? I think it's kind of like a scrap job. Honestly, it feels like a scrap job. There's just, it's similar to like the pharmaceutical industry and like all of these things, it's just capitalism. And so it's driven by, and I like, I'm not opposed to capitalism. Like I do business clearly, but I think when you introduce this element of there's many schools out there that are for-profit schools, like I don't know how much of that is keeping our kids' interest at heart and with all the government and everything. So, you know, there's an organization out there, I think it's called twohourlearning.com, that's doing some really, really innovative things in the space, homeschooling, world schooling. Like there's a lot of changes being made, but it's being made kind of outside of the education system itself because this thing is like a cruise ship and it is hard to turn. It's going to take a lot more effort to turn than I think anyone could ever expect. And sometimes I'll talk to my husband about it And he's so great and has all these visionary ideas. What if we did this? And what if we did this? What if this? But having been inside the system, I can say like, well, that won't work because of this. And that won't work because of this. And that won't work. So outside looking in, you think like, why is this so hard to change? But inside looking out, it's almost like, I don't, I maybe just start from scratch. What that looks like, I don't know. And then, you know, start from scratch with the idea of helping kids learn how to think and embrace their values, not become factory workers, which is why school was created the way it was. Talk to me a little bit more about that, because I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. I mean, I feel like the school system is still, I mean, coming from another country, you know, like I was born and raised in Spain and our school was from nine to five, get the bus at eight, get home at six, you know, because it finishes at five and you had your lunch breaks. And and so to me, I still don't understand how schools are from 730 or even eight, you know, or nine or whatever, if you go to a private school, but they end at three. I'm like, well, how does that work with our system currently? You know, like that made sense in the fifties when moms would stay home and dads were the breadwinners, but now you have both two working parents, you know, like, what are you supposed to do? And especially if you have, I mean, I only have one kid. I'm like, how do you take two kids or three or more to all these different activities and not go crazy? I I don't know. I have so many thoughts about (laughs) schooling and the system, but it is pretty broken with it, Jasmine. And do you have kids? See, I don't. So I can't speak from the perspective of a parent. But you can speak from the perspective of the teacher, like you were saying, like you can come up with ideas and you know all the insides like, yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah, that's a great idea, but- You'd have to go through all these hurdles. I'll also say I was not a teacher during the pandemic. Like I Mm. finished my last year of teaching was in 2017. So, you know, I've been out of the classroom 
for two and a half years when the pandemic started. So I think, you know, even since then, there's been like a lot of changes and it got even hard. I cannot, I do not know how these teachers did hybrid classrooms when you have five and six year olds and some of them are in front of you in the classroom and other of them are on Zoom. Like I just, I cannot fathom it. I just like, it's just boggles my brain. And yeah, you know, I think that school was created so that we could have good workers. You know, you show up on time, you're taught to sit down and listen to authority. You're taught to, you know, what are the correct and incorrect ways to do things according to what the person of authority says and thinks. You're told what you should learn and what you should know how to do by, you know, the state standards and the school system that you're in. And I think it's all about just creating people who, when they're in the workforce, will are built for a workforce of people that will just obey. And I'm not saying that students shouldn't learn to collaborate, learn with, you know, be kind and compassionate and have empathy and, you know, the values of like how, what it should, what it means to someone when you have an agreement with them to be a certain place at a certain time and you show up and it's a sign of respect. And I just think there needs to be some big changes if we want to create space for the next generation to do more for the world than our generation has. Because our generation, you know, to become an entrepreneur in today's day and age, it's easier than ever because we have the internet, which people are we're ge- getting exposed to other ways of life and other ways of being. And I think, the, you know, this current, the Gen Z generation is all about, they know that. And so they're acting with this new knowledge of, I don't have to just grow up and become a teacher, a lawyer, or a doctor. And I think, you know, for the kids that are in school now, what does that mean for them? And how can we create an educational system that allows them to embrace all of who they are and be and still be good citizens, but not necessarily, you know, built to just work for someone else's dream. Yeah, this is so, oh, we could do a whole other episode on on unschooling. I'm serious and kids, because I want to take it in different directions, like with course, you know, creation for adults, as well as your opinion with kids. We're going to take another quick pause and I'll have a couple other questions for you, Jasmine. I want to share an amazing opportunity with you. My signature event, Increase Your Income and Impact, which is happening this November 7th through the 9th in person in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You will walk away from these three days, shifting your mindset from not enough money to manifesting on the spot. You'll also learn how to get over your fears and unworthiness so that you can have a greater impact on the world. These in-person events are life transforming. Just listen to what one of our participants has to say. Hello, my name is Mackenzie, and I just finished an amazing event called Increase Your Impact and Income. And I just want to share one of my biggest takeaways, which is the simple key elements to making a quantum leap. And I highly recommend it to anyone who is interested in having a very intimate group setting with a container for collaboration, connection, helping, lifting each other up. It was just really, really positive. I had an amazing time and amazing people and I'm looking forward to the next one. If you found this inspiring, if you'd like to join us in Santa Fe, New Mexico this November, I'm gifting you an 80% discounted ticket. All you have to do is leave me a rating and a review on iTunes, take a screenshot and email us at help.thecouragetobe at gmail.com and type in event discount to claim your discounted ticket. You can find that email in our show notes, as well as the website to our event. I look forward to being your mentor and guide to transform your life. See you in Santa Fe. So we were talking about schooling and kids, and I think we are going to do another episode with, you know, schooling kids, your perspective and what you would do different, even though you're not in that realm right now. But if you did have a kid right now, what kind of schooling would you do with them? Would you do homeschooling? Would you because you've been a teacher. We would do homeschooling or Mm -hmm. some kind of hybrid experience, world schooling kind of a situation. I think what, like what most people don't know is if you homeschool a kid, it's two hours a day because you're doing one-on-one instruction, which is just a much different quality and caliber than me teaching to a group of people. Just like, you know, you're one-on-one work you can help someone get from a to b a lot quicker one-on-one than in a group than in a you know a diy self-paced course like there is parallels here 
So we would probably, we would do that. And I'm not sure exactly the scenario, but you know, my husband and I both agreed, like our kids are not probably ever going to go to school unless they request and go and like it. And like for the social element, that's really what they need to be happy and fulfilled. And it's hard to say coming from a former teacher, but you'll see if you go look at, I don't have any statistics or studies up top of mind, but I know that they're out there to show that there's many, many administrators who will not send their kids to school. There's many, many teachers who will not send their kids to school. Oh, yeah. And successful. If- I mean, if you go to like people like Elon Musk, they're homeschooling. You know, I don't think Bill Gates is in that one, but there's a lot of, you know, successful people that you start wondering like, well, why are your kids not going to school and you're just homeschooling? Talk to me about world schooling. I'm curious about that too. World schooling is, and I'm not an expert in this at all, but it's essentially doing a lot more travel and getting in the world as a way to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And so just infusing that and everything. And I will say that like homeschooling, world schooling, all of this requires a certain level of privilege. Privilege and time and capacity from the parents too. Because I mean, what through the pandemic, like you were mentioning before, our daughter was six and she was just learning how to read, you know? And I was like, can't do this online. Like we need, and she was going to Waldorf, which that was a whole other, you know, like they weren't doing anything zoom, you know, like at least the public schools, we had just taken out of public school. And so we ended up homeschooling her for 14 months because of just here in, in New Mexico, we could not go back to school, everything was online in the next school year. So it wasn't just the first three months. It was the next school year, the choice of homeschooling or everything online. And she was only six or seven. And I was like, it made no sense. But so now, of course, she keeps asking. She's like, I want to continue being homeschooled. It's like, well, we also have to work and we're not teachers. And yeah. So yes, we'll definitely do, I'd love to do another episode about the, the, you know, like how we would restructure what, what ideas, you know, just to hear it from your perspective, you know, as a former teacher and just to wrap it up for those that have been teachers like yourself, you know, because it's so underpaid. So many teachers fled schooling after COVID. What would you say to them? if they are already teachers and they wanted to start their own business, how can they do it? I mean, because that's been your journey and you've been successful with it. Like how can they trust and believe in themselves to say, you know what, let me take all the knowledge I have and I could teach adults something else, you know, like how could they do that? Can you inject a little bit of inspiration to our listeners that might want to go down that path? Every time I'm at a high level mastermind, right? With surrounded by business owners doing seven, eight, sometimes even nine figure businesses. And it always comes up, oh, what's like one thing that's really worked for you in the past year? And I always recommend that they go and hire teachers every time because like that is the secret sauce to my success is one, I'm a teacher but I only hire teachers. And it's because there's a multitude of transferable skills that teachers don't see because they just think of them as second nature at this point. They can't even see how they're a unicorn because they're surrounded by other unicorns who are all managing to do this thing that is teaching. Teachers can be great project managers. They can be great content writers. They can be great affiliate managers. They can be copywriters. They can be YouTube managers. That like literally like the list goes on and on and on because you have the skill set of teaching, which means that you likely as a teacher, you likely learn much faster and much easier than most. You're used to working without a whole ton of, you have direction, but you also have a level of, a small level of creativity. You're used to meeting deadlines. You're used to showing up when, you know, it's not easy to show up. There's just so much that goes into being a good teacher that any employer would be crazy not to hire for. And also as an employee, like if you are listening and you are not a teacher, but you are an employer, I recommend this because teachers, as you mentioned, get paid nothing. So if you pay them a decent salary and don't treat them, like don't be a jerk, they will stay with you. They will be loyal to you because you got them out of the thing that they thought they were going to have to do forever that they just hated. And I'd say like, that's the story of all the teachers I've hired is like, 
I pay them a good wage and I'm nice and I'm there for them and I'm flexible and they have a lot of freedom in their week. And it's like, they can't even believe it gets this good. So I think there's just so much power in like a teacher owning all of these things that you can do for people. The key is learning how what you've already done translates to what they're looking for. Because I promise you it's there. You just have to look for it. If you're an employer, I would literally go and put in your job description, like looking for former teachers and then start using the hashtag, hashtag transitioning teacher. I like, no kidding. I will put up a job post on LinkedIn and within an hour, I have 150 applications. This is such great tips, you know, for any teachers that are in transition and wanting to look for work. This, while we'll definitely do another episode, Jasmine, I'd like to focus on kids and the future of education, you know, with our young ones, you know, of like what we could add, how we could make it better. But for now, where could people find you? How can they become part of your community? You can find me at creation, C-R-E-8-T-I-O-N.co slash free course. And you can get my free mini course on how to build a course. Yes, it's very meta. And on social media, I'm most active on Instagram. It's just my name, Jasmine Jonte, and my YouTube channel, which is Jasmine Jonte as well. So those are all the places where I hang out and my people hang out. Thank you. And we'll put that in the show notes too. And before we wrap up, do you have like a client story that you'd like to share with us of them creating a course or they didn't believe that, you know, like, can I put this into a course or I don't know, some success story with how you've done your process and how you help others? Yeah, I have a great CFO, chief financial officer coming to mind. Her name's Teresa Clark. She's just like a gem. I just adore her. And she's a CFO for nonprofits. So she helps either the CFO in the nonprofit or sometimes it's just a volunteer who's the treasurer for the nonprofit, right? She helps them organize the financials for the nonprofit, which I love because it's such a butterfly effect for us in helping her build this program. She's helping these nonprofits, which is helping all of these people who really need help and support that the nonprofits are serving across different industries. And you know, she came to us and she had done like a group training program before because people in non like nonprofits don't necessarily have a lot of money to hire a CFO fractionally to work with them, but they really need the support to get to the place where they can hire the CFO fractionally. And so she'd done a bit of a group program, but she just came to us and she's like, I just don't feel confident selling this. It's just kind of me talking and like, I give great value, but I just don't feel good enough to like go and sell this independently at, on its own. And so we took in that content that she had. We interviewed her, which is our main process. We did everything with this beautiful graphic design, gave her a framework so she can really help her um, students see where they're starting and where they're going, all the steps on that journey. And um, she's just now finishing with our production editing team, I think like this week. So we're right towards the end. So I don't have any like results, but I know that her YouTube channel is doing well. She has people book on the call with her and do one-on-ones and so many of them just can't afford her. And so it's just a perfect opportunity to continue to like serve and help these people who are so like they desire it and they deserve it. And yeah, like help them in this group format so that she's has a new revenue stream that requires less of her time that creates just as great of a transformation as that one-on-one. -on -one. So that's a story that's that, just off the top. Yeah, that is awesome. And just the impact as you were mentioning that story, you know, like the impact of you guys putting the course. So do you guys create the whole course for her, you know, and guide her along the way? And then she just has the end result as a course already ready to sell. Yeah. So we're talking like framework, course outline, video scripts, slide decks, workbooks, online portal, video production, video editing, like the entire end to end product. So people come to us with an idea and they leave with a product that they can sell over and over and over again, and that they can also repurpose into other products. So, you know, if you have a signature program, well, what from that signature program can you pull out as a lead magnet? 
what in that signature program can you pull out and sell as a micro course? What can you use as book bonuses? Like there's all these ways. I mean, I think of programs like Lego blocks and there's these tiny little Lego blocks and we're using these Lego blocks to create the program. Well, how can you take those Lego blocks apart to build something else for another revenue stream in your business? Like that's where the game gets really fun because it's so efficient and effective, but you know, it takes some forethought to make that happen. Anyway, I digress, but Teresa's is great. We love her. We're stoked for her. And you should, if you're in, if you're a CFO or you run a nonprofit, like you should go check it out soon. That's great. And I love how you described it, you know, like it's just taking the Lego pieces and building something else and then build something mm-hmm. else. And then you can build something else. And it's like, oh my God. Yes. So Thanks for clarifying and simplifying. You are good at what you do, Jasmine. So thanks for that. I like to finish up the episode by asking my guest in this particular case yourself, what's one thing our listeners can do to live a life with more courage? One of our values as a company is called Courageous in Creativity. And I think that... In order to be truly creative, you need to be courageous, you need to try new ideas, and you need to be okay if they don't work. And I think of any kind of content, but especially course content, as iterative. And so you have to be courageous to just be creative in putting the thing out there the first time. It's not all going to work, but some of it will. And the other stuff you can iterate on and continue to get reps and being courageous in creativity. So whether that's your next... LinkedIn post or Instagram reel or course video or whatever it is, I encourage you to take a a creative risk. Thank you for that. This was wonderful spending time with you and getting to go inside your brain, Jasmine. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. If you like this episode and you'd like to feel this kind of energy live and in person, I want to share with you about my upcoming event, Increase Your Income and Impact which is happening November 7th through the 9th in person in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You will walk away from these three days shifting your mindset from not enough money to manifesting on the spot. You'll also learn how to get over your fears and unworthiness so that you can have a greater impact in the world. I'll gift you an 80% discounted ticket. All you have to do is leave me a rating and review on iTunes, take a screenshot and email us at help.thecouragetobe at gmail.com and type in event discount to claim your discounted ticket. I look forward to being your mentor and guide to transform your life. See you in Santa Fe.